Well, it's time for the Word of God. And we come this morning to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, on the supremacy of Christ. You know, there's a principle that's taught in Scripture, and that is that the closer you get to God, the bigger He seems. But the opposite is also true in that equation. The further you are, the smaller God seems to be. And when God seems distant, He can also seem very small. When I was a child, we lived outside of New York City on the New Jersey side, and often for special occasions, my dad would take us into the city. One day he said, Fred, today I'm taking you to the Empire State Building. I said, wow, the Empire State Building. He said, yes, son, it's the largest building in the world, and at, then it, at that time it was. And I said, well, how big is it, Dad? We went to the train station, and you could see the New York City skyline from the train station. He said, now hold up your finger. And I held up my finger, and there off in the distance was the, the little protrusion of the Empire State Building. He says, now as we get closer, you're going to see what happens. But we got closer and almost just outside the city, and he said, now hold up your finger. And at that point, my finger was about the size of the Empire State Building. We got off the train, we got on a subway, we got off at Fifth Avenue, and we stepped onto the street, and I, he said, hold up your finger. I said, well, where is it? He says, it's right here. And there we were standing right next to the Empire State Building, and I looked up and I held up my little finger. And now that my finger was eclipsed by the grandeur of this enormous building. But it was even something else when we went in to the Empire State Building. Got on an elevator that took us up to the 90 whatever floor. And there we went to the observation tower and looked out. Now we were in the Empire State Building. And we were almost hanging over not literally, but it felt that way. It was intimidating, and it made me feel so small in comparison to the grandeur. When God is at a distance, you can hold up your finger, and it seems like you are bigger than, than God. But the closer you get, in fact, when you come to know Jesus Christ, you come in to his grandeur, and it makes you feel smaller than ever, and yet so loved and affirmed to let you know and let me know that when God sent his son Jesus Christ, he did it to welcome you into his presence. We come uh, today to these incredible verses that give really the first hymn of the church. Uh, the book of Colossians, verses 15 to 20, contain this magnificent picture that gives 10 descriptions of Christ. And everyone elevate Christ higher and higher and shows the supremacy of Christ. Now these 10 names of God contained in these verses are in two verses of, the, of this hymn. The first verse shows five reasons we declare the supremacy of Christ over creation. And the other five show why we declare the supremacy of Christ over his recreation, over us as the church, the people of God who've been redeemed from out of the broad creation. He's redeemed a handful of people that he's brought into relationship with himself. And the, the even more magnificent aspect is how the five that show the supremacy of Christ in creation and the five that show the supremacy of Christ in his recreation line up side by side. And that's why today, as we open the Word of God, we're going to see more clearly, perhaps than ever before, the grandeur, the greatness of God in Christ. It begins the hymn with the first of the first five. He is the image of the invisible God. That is to say, He's the one who most accurately can communicate who God is. You see God most accurately in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He, he said, I and my Father are one. In fact, it goes on to say in the book of, of Hebrews, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, Long ago, 
At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Spoken to us, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. What a magnificent picture of Jesus, the one who communicates God, the image of the invisible God. Now, we know in the Ten Commandments, we're told you shall not make an, an image for yourself or an idol in the shape of anything. Now, notice the difference. It's wrong for us to create an image, but God sent an image in, the, in his Son. And because the Son comes from the Father, not as a projection from us, but as a revelation from God. One of the flaws of our humanity is that we are constantly projecting our image on God. God is never known by projection. God is only known by revelation. And the revelation of God is his son, Jesus Christ. The same God who said, let there be light, now shines the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want to take us back to that magnificent statue over on the hill overlooking Rio de Janeiro. It's the statue known as uh, Christ the Redeemer. Now often in the history, modern history, they project an image on that beautiful statue. And every time I'm deeply moved, when the nations of the world began to come under the pandemic, they, they projected all the, the, the flags of the world onto Jesus as if he's the, the Jesus for the nations. And I love that. Recently, they projected two images of healthcare workers, a doctor, and Christ is the great physician. And then a nurse or an attending physician as a healthcare provider. And I was deeply moved. And there's certainly value that we gain in these images. But again, let me remind us, we will always end up as small as we are when we project our image of God. The only way to know the true God is not by projection, but by revelation. God reveals himself in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the image. He is the one and the only one who communicates who God is to us. Hallelujah. Now, secondly, our God, Christ, is the one who sits enthroned over creation. It says in verse 15, he is the firstborn over creation. Now, the firstborn in this context doesn't mean that he was born. What it means, it's the position of being firstborn. He's the heir apparent. His father owns everything. And the father gives the inheritance to the firstborn. So he's the firstborn over creation. He's the one who will inherit the creation. That's why the Bible says the Lord, speaking of God the Father, said to my Lord, referring to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool. And that's what's happening in our day. Because Jesus is the coming monarch. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And even through this pandemic time, we worship the one who will inherit all things. The third title is he's the creator. It says here in verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him. Now, isn't it interesting that in the first chapter of the Bible, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now that's referring to the physical universe. This verse, Colossians 1.16, goes beyond the physical to refer to the angels and all the ranks and file of the angelic beings. So God created the visible and the invisible in his son, Jesus Christ. Number four, he not only is the creator, he's the owner. It says again in verse 16, all things were created through him and for him. He's the owner of this world. Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's. That's why when Jesus rose from the dead, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He is the owner. And finally, number five, it, it goes on and it says, he manages and sustains everything. Verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Every atom, every molecule, the solar system, the orbit of the planets around the sun, all that owes its holding together to Christ who holds all things together. Every molecule is held together by Christ. Every atom with the uh, nucleus and the electrons, all that is held together by Christ. In the human body, every system in the body is held together by Christ. I want to tell you something. This is so powerful to me. Every cell in the body, every second, they say, has chemical reactions that are taking place. In fact, every second, there are one billion chemical reactions taking place in every cell. Now, to put that in perspective, a one billion is a one followed by uh, 12 zeros. That's one cell every second. But think of how many cells there are in the human body. There are 37 trillion cells in the human body. 37 trillion cells every second having 1 billion chemical reactions inside every cell. That's 37 followed by 21 zeros, or a thousand billion billion reactions taking place in your body and in my body every second. And we didn't even have to think about it. We didn't tell them when to fire. We didn't tell them what chemical reactions to take place. It happens because Christ holds all things together. He oversees the function of the body, the function of every atom, of every molecule of the solar system. He oversees and holds them all together in Christ. That's why we can say that he might have the supremacy, that he might have first place over creation. Now, that's the first half of the first verse of this hymn. The second verse focuses on the church, those that are redeemed, those from all creation that are called into love covenant relationship with the Father. And here we have five names and five virtues and activities of Jesus. First of all, he's the gatherer and leader of the redeemed. It says in verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He deserves the supremacy because he's the head. He's the one that gathered us 
that found us in a ditch somewhere, who redeemed our lives and called us together, and he's the head, he's the leader. Second, he's the initiator of our love relationship. It says again, verse 18, he is the beginning. He's the one that initiated. It says in Romans chapter five, verse eight, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that when we were yet sinful, rebellious, cocky, renegades, destitute, hopeless, Christ died for us. He initiated it. When we weren't thinking of him, he came and found us. Or it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he first loved us. And my friend, no matter who you are, God loves you. No matter what you think of him, he loves you. And he died on the cross to win you into covenant love relationship with him forever. I can't believe I'm doing this, but I want to use Hallmark movies as an illustration. Uh, pardon me uh, for this. Um, I don't care so much for Hallmark movies, but my wife loves Hallmark movies, and I love my wife. Now, if you've ever seen one, you know that they all have the, the same plot. Uh, they all have two people that don't know they love each other, and neither one wants to admit it. But somewhere before the end of the movie, and you know within the first five minutes who these two people are, and you know where they're gonna end up, they're gonna end up with a little kiss by the end. They may not be married, but at least they're gonna kiss. And somewhere in the last five minutes of the movie, one of them will have the audacity to admit, I love you. Oh, well, I've loved you all along. It's the first one that takes, that kind of breaks the ice. All Hallmark movies are the same. Well, as cheesy as that is, I want to tell you, Jesus Christ does not wait to the end of the movie to tell you, I love you. He said it up front. Long before you and I were born, God demonstrated how much he loves us in the way that he sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. Don't wait till the end of your life to receive the love of Christ. God tells you before you ever tell him, I love you, I love you, I love you. And he does, and you can trust him. And he deserved the supremacy because he went first to establish a love covenant relationship with you and with me. What this means, number three, is he alone is our savior. It says, he is the firstborn from the dead. Now this is entirely different than the firstborn of creation. The firstborn of creation is the position that Christ has as the only son of God. But the firstborn from the dead represents what he did for us in the atonement. He was dead and buried. He was literally buried and literally dead. But on the third day, God breathed life back into that mortal body, rolled away the stone, and Christ came out victorious. He was the firstborn from the dead. And firstborn because every person that puts their faith in Jesus Christ is also raised from spiritual death into life. We are what the Bible says, born again of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And because of that, he deserves the supremacy. So he's the gatherer, he's the initiator, he's the savior. Number four, he is the only one who is the full dwelling place of God. He is Emmanuel. Uh, it goes to great length to say, for in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Think of that. It's the incarnation. The, the one who was with God forever. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
took upon human flesh, and in that mortal baby's body, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He was and is today Emmanuel, God with us, the dwelling place of God. That's why those of us who love the manifest presence of God love Christ because Christ is the manifest presence of God. Just as he is the image, the one who represents God to all people, he is the one who is the fullness of God. And that's why it goes on in Colossians 1 and it says of the church that the church, the hope of the church is Christ in us, corporately, the hope of glory. The same Christ who is the fullness of God in human form is now dwelling among us as the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And number five, he is the peacemaker. It says here in Colossians 1 verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Christ has reconciled us to himself. We who were once strangers have now been fully reconciled. What a picture. What a picture of the love, the beauty, the glory of Christ. For 10 reasons, he deserves the supremacy. For five reasons related to the creation. Five reasons related to the recreation, the community of the church. And he sits above them all. That is not a projection of what we want him to be. That is a revelation of who Christ is today. No, my friend, the Achilles heel of our humanity is our inclination to project God in our image, to hold up our finger, and when God is, is at a distance from us, far removed, to think that we are greater than he is. It's like a child 10 miles from the Empire State Building thinking, oh, that's no great thing, until the child gets off the subway and holds up his finger and recognizes that that enormous building is the Empire State Building, and not only seeing it from the outside, but be welcomed inside. God wants to welcome you into his presence. He wants to welcome you into the church. He wants to welcome you into a covenant love relationship. Now these words were written to a church in crisis in the city of Colossae. At the time, there were three viruses, so to speak, that were attacking the church. Uh, obviously not COVID-19, but they had viruses of their own. There was a philosophical virus their thinking was all wrong. There was a, it was a behavioral virus that affected their activities. And there was a relational virus that affected the community within the church. And in the next three weeks, we're gonna take these one at a time, but the antidote for all three is the supremacy of Christ. It's the supremacy of Christ that deals with our thinking and our mystic. It's the supremacy of Christ that deals with our behavior. And it's the supremacy of Christ that deals with our community and our relationship one with another. No, my friend, Jesus loves you. He wants a love relationship with you and he wants it to start now. No matter what you've ever thought of God before, I present to you Jesus Christ, the image 
of the invisible God. The only place you can look and accurately find who God is today. And out of the translation of the Bible, the message, let me just finish with these words. This is the translation of these verses we're looking at from the message. We look at this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose for everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything God started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme to the end. From beginning to end, he is there towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, God properly fixed and fitted perfectly together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. It's that simple. This is the substance of our message. We preach Christ. 